This is Captain Travis Wood from Company 10. Thank you for watching this edition of Virginia Beach's Frontline Firefighter. This month on Virginia Beach Frontline Firefighter, Master Firefighter Mike Callagher shows us how to manage friction and anchor considerations. VBFD Fitness Director Herb West outlines the advantages of body weight exercises. On SCBA checklist, David Stites explains the new second stage regulator upgrade. Hearing protection is vital in the fire service. The VBFD Safety Committee reviews the importance of using this equipment. Finally, on the wild side, Master Firefighter Rory Hoyleman brings us a look at the less common venomous reptiles you may encounter. I'm Master Firefighter Tom Parks. Here's your host for this month's Virginia Beach Frontline Firefighter, Master Firefighter Stuart Sayer. Hello everyone and welcome to Virginia Beach Frontline Firefighter for October 2013. As you just heard from Tom Parks, the program is loaded with training. Our first training segment deals with important considerations when determining anchor points. I'm Master Firefighter Mike Callagher. On this edition of Tech Rescue Minute, I'm going to go over a little demonstration on managing anchors and friction. Okay, what I wanted to show you today was um, managing friction and anchor considerations. When we put a load on um, something, it's going to have a, a force you know that you might uh, might not expect so today I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over and show you a little demonstration what I have here is I have a scale and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull this 10 pound weight over this edge on this table and you're gonna see that when I pull it the weight is actually gonna increase because we have friction alright so we take that 10 pound weight and I go to pull it you'll see how much it changes I was pulling somebody over the edge, you could see it went up to 31, 32, and 29. It all depends on, you know, obviously this edge is a little harder. And that's a straight pull. So my 10 pound weight actually increased to 30 some pounds. So if you think about that on a person, you know, a 200 pound person coming up, you're actually lifting close to 600 pounds over a hard angle. You know, roughly. It depends on how much friction you have. Now, what I've done is I've done a simple COD here at the anchor, all right? We knew what I was pulling before was close to 30 pounds, but let's see what we get now. You can see it is increased, and it's almost double in some cases. It got up to 60 some pounds, actually have more friction, but look at the weight forces we're putting on that anchor. So when I'm pulling, you can see that it doubled. You know, when I pulled here, we had 30 some pounds on a 10 pound weight going over that friction, you know, that edge. Then, now that I'm pulling on this side of it, I've got my 30 on this side and another 30 on that side. So now I'm putting additional 60 some pounds, give or take a few pounds, on that when I pull. So think about that with your anchor. Say I'm pulling up a person, 200 pound load, I can double, you know, triple that, 600 pounds. So I could put, be putting 1,200 pounds just to get one person up over the edge. So if you think about that, what am I anchoring to? What's my anchor? All right, that's something to think about. A lot of people know, you know. But I'll show you a way we can uh, we can improve that. This simple system here, everybody's seen it before. A simple little Z Z rig here. And now, if you, as you can see, yes, I have that friction coming over, but I'm going to overcome some of that by putting in this mechanical advantage. So as I pull nice and easy and my weight's up to 13 now. Why is that? Through this mechanical advantage but I'm also pulling some of it. All right so this pulley is actually helping this anchor okay because I'm coming over here and I'm sharing some of that weight. So we want to come in and we want to do a COD. Remember it's not a moving pulley it's fixed at the anchor so it has no mechanical advantage but I need to change direction. Say I need to come up here, I've run out of room on top of the building, I need to put a COD on there. Look what happens now. Put that COD on here, and look at 
the weight of my anchor now. It's went up 40 some pounds, okay? So now at 10 pound load, I've still got 40 some pounds of force on my anchor. All right, that was a little demonstration. Um, if you have any questions, you can contact me. You know, there, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of them. You know, we've taken this out and we've tested it um, with large scale with half inch ropes and, and full uh, 200 to 300 pound loads. And we were getting the same you know, results as we're getting on the small scale. So I figured we'd start with this small scale, do a little demonstration on that, and, uh, and just uh, open up some questions, you know, that you have, and, we'll, and I can answer them. Part two of this, we're gonna go and I'm gonna do an actual high anchor point simulating maybe a ladder or a high directional, and I'll show you that. Thanks. Next up, we'll look at body weight exercises on Herb West's Fitness Forum. Welcome, I'm Herb West, the Fitness Director for the Virginia Beach Fire Department, and today we're going to be talking about body weight exercises. After we talk briefly about body weight exercises, we're going to go through a circuit that we do here at the Wellness Center and show you how to do that. First thing we want to do is talk about the advantages of body weight exercise. One of the biggest advantages is that there's very little equipment needed. Today, We'll be using a medicine ball, a band, a pull-up bar, and a TRX. Another advantage of body weight exercises are they can be done just about anywhere. You can do it when you're at work, you can do it when you're at home, you can do it on the road. All you need is your body. And that brings up the third advantage of body weight exercises. They're extremely functional because you're doing functional movements with your body as your exercise source. And the last advantage that we want to talk about is they're very good to use with groups, such as at the station. Since there's not a lot of equipment, you don't have to wait for equipment to do the exercise. Next, we want to talk about, and we're often asked, well, how can you change resistance in body weight exercises? Basically, there are three ways you can change resistance. One is you can increase the number of repetitions you're doing. The second one is use less rest time between circuits and between exercises. And the last one is to use a more difficult version of the exercise when you're doing it. Now let's look at the circuit that we use at the Wellness Center. We're gonna go through it, give you the numbers you should be doing on this and the exercises. Circuit one, you will be doing 10 reps of pull-ups from this list according to your ability. If you cannot do 10, you can do it with bands, with assistance, or negatives. Pull-ups, 10 reps. Wide grip, narrow grip, chin up, with a band, with assistance, negatives. You will be doing 20 reps of TRX presses from this list according to your ability. Shoulder exercises include push-ups and rows should be done with regard to the individual shoulder range of motion. Greater angle Straight down, single leg. You will be doing 30 reps of squats from this list according to your ability. If you have knee problems or you have not done squats before, you should only go to a position where the thigh is parallel to the floor. Squats, 30 reps. Single leg squats, plyometric squats, one minute front plank. Circuit two, you will be doing 20 reps of TRX rows from this list according to your ability. Greater angle, 
combine wide grip with narrow grip. You will be doing 20 reps of push-ups from this list according to your ability. Plyometrics being a power and speed exercise put more stress on the joints. Therefore, you should not start with plyometrics but advance through the other forms before attempting. When beginning plyometrics, keep repetitions low until you have mastered the exercise. Push-ups, 20 reps, feet elevated, chest elevated, medicine ball alternate side, plyometric. You will be doing 20 reps per leg of lunges from this list according to your ability. Lunges. 20 per leg, backward, directional, plyometric, side plank right, 30 seconds, side plank left, 30 seconds. So that's it with body weight exercises. If you have any questions, please give me a call. And anything you'd like to see on the next segment, let me know. The VBFD is in the process of upgrading the second stage regulators on our 2020 plus HUD style face pieces. For more, here is the next installment of the SCBA checklist. You may begin to see new second stage regulators on your SCBA. They work just like your old second stage regulators. They are aligned the same way with the bypass knob in the same place. The manual override and the reset button are all in the same location. They are just covered in a new skin. Many of you will remember when we replaced the black air clicks in your mask with the gray ones that should be there now. This new second stage regulator is the second half of the upgrade to improve the second stage to face piece seal. You should feel an improved air click fit and get a better air click to second stage regulator seal. The manufacturer's upgrade verbiage reads as follows. Honeywell has discovered that it is possible for a CBRN second stage regulator to be fully inserted into the air click in all 2020 plus HUD style face pieces, but still have a slight amount of air leakage around the interface of those two components. This leakage primarily occurs when the second stage hose is pulled forward, causing the second stage to move slightly forward at an angle within the air click breaking the seal between the air click o-ring and the second stage regulator. The potential leakage is minimal, amounting to about one minute's worth of air volume using a 30 minute rated cylinder at about 40 liters per minute breathing rate and only if the second stage hose is being constantly pulled forward. If the hose is never pulled forward or is only pulled forward intermittently, the leakage would be significantly less. Because of the positive pressure maintained in the face piece, the leakage is only outward, preventing the intrusion of contaminants and maintaining the user's protection. Please understand this is not a recall. Your old second stage regulators are safe and have passed flow testing for the past eight years. This is merely an upgrade. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, David. As everyone knows, loud noise en route and on the scene of incidents is always an issue. How you protect yourself against this problem is in your hands. Here's firefighter Danny Woods from the VBFD Safety Committee with a segment on hearing protection. This month we're going to be talking about hearing protection and the importance of wearing it and the new hearing protection that you will shortly see in the field. Speaking on behalf of the Safety Committee, I want to talk a little bit on the topic of hearing loss in the fire service. It goes without saying that our hearing is one of the most important assets that we have. The goal of this segment is to reiterate the importance of utilizing available resources to limit your exposure to excessive noise. Hearing loss is irreversible, but it is preventable. In 1998, the IAFF Department of Health and Safety, in conjunction with NIOSH, conducted a study involving 458 firefighters, which consisted of a questionnaire and a pure tone test similar to our annual physical. They took the results of that study and compared them to a similar one done in 1984 
and the results indicated that 33% had what was considered normal hearing loss. The remainder of the individuals ranged from moderate to severe hearing loss. It's unreasonable to expect that in every instance where we are exposed to high levels of noise that we have hearing protection available or in place. There are, however, many instances where we are not involved in an emergent situation but working in and around a noisy environment. Every morning we are involved with apparatus checkoff to include running generators, saws, and fans. Utilize the hearing protection that is assigned to the truck while you have the extra time to do so. Whether you are using your own personal or assigned ear pro, this is the most common situation where we should be utilizing ear protection. Another example would be a working commercial fire alarm where we are walking up and down hallways and passages and the fire alarm is screaming in our ears. Being subjected to high levels of noise for an extended period of time will have an effect on your hearing, whether it shows up sooner or later in your career. We are simply asking that you please take the extra time, when possible, to protect your hearing. In the near future, two new forms of EarPro will be available in addition to keeping the orange EarPro in your fanny pack. Every station will be issued a canister of disposable EarPro. The idea is that we place or mount that canister in the apparatus bay in such a manner that hearing protection can be quickly and easily accessed when needed. This EarPro will also be disposable and it is only meant for one-time use. It will also be an item that when empty, refills can be requested through station supplies. The second form of EarPro you will receive is on an individual basis. Every employee will be issued a set of EarPro similar to the set in the fanny pack. This new set will be connected with string instead of the old plastic, which will make it more durable with the prospect that it will last longer than the old version. It will also come with a protective hard plastic case to prevent unnecessary wear while not in use. Thank you again for tuning in with me on this month's edition of Safety Stand Down. Again, my name is Firefighter Danny Woods. You can contact me at Company 18 or on my email. And please, if you have any ideas for future segments or any questions or comments about this one, please contact anybody from the Safety Committee or myself and I'll make sure that everybody gets the word. In the final segment of The Wild Side, Master Firefighter Rory Hoyleman shows us some of the less common reptiles you may encounter. But you know they're out there. Hi, welcome to this edition of The Wild Side. Last month we talked about lizards and the month before we talked about snakes that you may encounter on EMS or fire calls. Today we're sitting here with Josh from Pet Paradise. He's going to talk to us about three tarantulas that he brought with us today. There's over 800 tarantula species in the world so you may encounter one of these on a call. Yeah. As weird as it sounds, tarantulas and spiders become a pretty big hobby. There's over 200 different species that are amongst this hobby. A lot of them are quite harmless, like this species here. Although she is large, tarantulas generally have a venom that is not very harmful to mammals. It does a lot to reptiles and insects, but nothing to us. So even this large tarantula, if it were to bite me right on the hand, wouldn't do more than a standard house spider. Now there are several other species, such as these two here, that are not quite so handleable, very, very aggressive species that you'd want to refrain from touching. But luckily, if you're going to go into a call, most of these are going to be in small containers. You can pick the whole thing up, and it's going to be pretty secure, so you're not going to have too much to worry about. Tarantulas are more scary than they are dangerous. Josh, how can we contain these uh, spiders if we needed to control them? If you were to come up on a spider that was loose, a large tarantula, you would never need to actually have direct contact. You find a container, such as a deli cup or a gladware container that's around the house, a cardboard box even, simply place it over the animal. They're naturally going to start climbing onto the sides. You can take, ideally, a piece of paper or a piece of cardboard and just very gently slip it underneath. What they're going to do is they're going to step up on that layer and now you have a contained tarantula that can't do anything to anybody. Josh, thanks for coming by and talking with us about tarantulas and Absolutely. how to properly contain them if we have to on a call or how to uh, handle them. Absolutely. As a growing hobby, you should be aware. You probably see them more and more. Now we're sitting here with Brian from Acme Animal Control. He's going to help us discuss uh, venomous snakes that we may encounter on EMS or fire calls. Uh, Brian, how can we tell if a snake is a venomous snake? 
Well, first of all, um, unless you have ex uh, extreme experience with snakes, uh, it's best to treat every snake as though it is venomous. Um, nine times out of ten, when somebody is bit by a snake, they're either trying to kill it or they think it's dead and they pick it up. So you, it's always important to treat every snake as though it is venomous if you're not 100% sure. Don't touch it. If it's in a container like this, this is the safest way to uh, deal with them, um, unless you have uh, somebody out there that knows what you're talking about or dealing with these guys on a daily basis. Okay, Brian, in this container we have a coral snake, and in this container we have what they call a milk snake. Can you tell us the difference or the, how we can tell which one is which? Well, um, they are very similar in color, whereas uh, both of these aren't native to Virginia. You can get houses or collectors that will have snakes that look similar. If you do see a snake, usually if it's brightly colored like this, always treat it as though it is a venomous snake if you're not 100% sure. Um, this guy right here, uh, I kind of opened this lid and whatnot. I mean, this guy's a kind of a secretive quieter type of snake. They like to burrow, so a lot of times you don't even see them inside the tank. So if there's a tank that's shut and you don't see anything in there, assume that the animal is in that enclosure and it is hiding because nine times out of ten they do like to hide. Um, they mainly come out, you know, when it's feeding time or, you know, at night when you know, everything's all nice and quiet. Now this type of snake right here, the coral snake, um, you know, they are, uh, you know, a smaller type of snake and they are, uh, their venom is highly toxic, but you know, for them to actually really bite you, they have to bite in between like your, the web end of your, of your fingers, soft spots, and they're not really known to bite. You really have to, you know, mess with them to get these guys to bite. They're not typically aggressive, but both of these species of snakes or are, uh, you know, very timid and do like to hide. So you may not even see them inside an enclosure when you do go into a house. Okay, Brian, what do we have in this container right here? Okay, in this container right here is uh, an, a cotton mouth or AKA water moccasin. Um, they go by both types of names. They are a, uh, a semi-aquatic snake, mainly found around ditches, fresh water ponds, lakes, streams, and uh, they are venomous. But the reason why they call them a cotton mouth, because the first thing you do when you walk up on a snake like this, they pop the mouth wide open and it's a white cotton color in there, you know, that's why they get that cotton mouth name. But they also vibrate their tail and they will also uh, musk to try to help, you know, warn you. Every snake is going to warn you before they bite or they're going to try to flee from you. Okay, Brian, we're going to have a, two more snakes out here. Can you tell us what they are and if they are native or not to this area? Okay, well we do have, uh, these are of course both copperheads. There's two different types. We have, this is a northern copperhead, which is one of the types that we would encounter over here. Now these are very common species that we find in this area. They are venomous, but they have a very mild type of venom. Maybe a little bit about around the side, uh, similar to a bee venom. They actually don't even administer any venom for these guys unless uh, you're allergic or you're a young child or an elderly and adu adult. Um, but uh, as you see, their, their colors blend very, very well with the leaves and patterns. Um, they are a pit viper. They have heat sensors in the top of their uh, you know, head there that they can see actually in the dark and see our tongue going. That's typically, that's what snakes do to smell. They have a special kind of an organ in there you know, that makes them smell 100 times better than we can smell. So but these guys you'll find very prevalent around uh, you know, your woodsy areas. You can find them around abandoned houses. What do we got in the bag here, Brian? Okay, the next snake we have is not a common uh, snake that you're going to uh, encounter. You can encounter it in uh, you know, a house if it's a, a, a reptile collector. This is a non-native species, but it is, a, it is a, actually a white monocle cobra. But if you hear her hissing, a lot of snakes will warn you before they bite. They hiss, they musk, they rattle their tail. The last thing they want to do is bite. That's uh, you know, definitely their last resort here. Okay, well this is uh, actually called a white sunset monocle cobra. Not a very common, um, you know, species. Uh, and she is actually, if you, if she, cobras actually have the ability to fold their hood into their body. So unless they raise their hood, which they only usually do in a display, a threatening display, or a warning display, she just looks like a regular old snake that you could find around here. 
Um, but if I can get her to raise this hood, you know, then you can actually see where she has ribs that just kind of fold in here. So, uh, Brian, if we happen to somehow see one of these walking or crawling around a house, what should we do with them? Um, well, the best thing to do is do not touch it. You definitely want to call, um, you know, somebody who's experienced with snakes. Um, unfortunately, your city animal controls, they mainly just handle cats and dogs. So, they're not going to have the expertise with this. Brian, what do we have next here? Okay, the next type of snake we have is a very common snake uh, as far as snakes in the venomous world. Um, this is actually a, an, an eastern diamondback rattlesnake. Um, you won't really find these around here, but we do have a similar type of rattlesnake called a canebrake rattlesnake that uh, you can find around here, but um, it's actually a protected species in Virginia, so it's against the law to kill them. As you hear that rattle, rattle going, you know, that's a, the biggest warning that you're going to hear. Um, and if you listen, do you ever hear that rattle? I mean, that's definitely your warning sign. These snakes um, aren't really too aggressive, and uh, they always warn you before, they're always going to warn you before they bite. So the snakes, uh, the canebrake rattlesnakes that we have in this area, which are just, uh, um, you know, the cousin to, you know, these types of snakes here. You can find them uh, around the Northwest River area, um, down there off of West Neck Road. You can find them often crossing the, uh, the roads and this and that. Um, now, these snakes are legal to own in the state of Virginia and also in the city of Virginia Beach and a lot of the other cities around here, you know, if you have a permit. Now, last month's edition of The Wild Side, I talked about common lizards you will find in people's homes. I wanted to bring this lizard out to show you on this edition because this is the Gila Monster. They're found in the southwest part of the United States, but people do have these as pets in their house. They are only one of two known lizards in the entire world that are venomous. Unlike the snakes, the venom glands are not in the back of the head. The venom glands are underneath her mouth. Uh, she doesn't necessarily inject the venom into their prey, they will bite and they sit there and they chew and chew and the saliva runs up their teeth into the prey's body and envenomates them. Uh, these are very, as you can see as they get bigger, they're very docile for people to uh, handle. No one has ever been registered as being killed or classified being killed by a hill monster since 1939. So uh, these are, they're very rare as far as fatalities in humans. But uh, this is as big as they get. Uh, and they are growing in popularity as a pet because of their bright color and they're so large. But again, this is a venomous reptile. Um, if someone were to be bit by one and they cannot get the animal to let loose, a good way to make the animal break free is submerging in water. The animal will naturally uh, let go of the person's hand and uh, that's how you break them free. Well, I'd like to thank Brian from Acme Animal Control and Josh from Pet Paradise and Zoo Pro Adventures for letting us use these animals in this edition of The Wild Side. If you have any more questions, you can feel free to call contact me at Company 6 on B-Shift or orhoyleman at bbgov.com. Thanks everyone for joining us on Virginia Beach Frontline Firefighter. As Tom Parks mentioned earlier, we encourage you to be involved with our program. Please like us on Facebook and watch all of our videos on the Virginia Beach Fire Department YouTube channel. If you or your shift has a segment idea for Frontline, contact Kurt Kellerhalls at the Fire Training Center. For the entire staff of Virginia Beach Frontline Firefighter, I'm Master Firefighter Stuart Sayer. Thanks for watching and see you next month. Stay safe. <laughs>